Hello, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm really excited to share with the API The Docs community my presentation, The UX of DX, User Testing in the Invisible World of APIs. My name is Jenny Wenger, and I am based out of Colorado in the United States. And let's jump right in, right? So what are we gonna be talking about today? We're gonna be talking about how to improve API usability by applying user experience and design methods. So our goal is to make sure that we're actually building what developers need and not just what our internal teams or what our developers tell us they want. We're trying to make sure that we can have great API docs by having really awesome APIs sitting underneath them. Right, we all have been there before where we're trying to write API docs for a poorly designed API and it's a major headache. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna go through a couple of different things. We're gonna start with a structure of a design framework. This is gonna help you understand how the design process works and how it applies to APIs. Well, then I'm gonna go through the steps of the design process and cover a couple of examples with each step in order to understand how to apply design philosophies to APIs. And then at the end, since a lot of this stuff is talking about designing new APIs, we're gonna cover at the end how to take these same things and apply them to APIs that already exist out in the world and how to compensate for some of the things that might've been done in the past and make sure that you still have a usable API. So our design framework has got four main steps in it. And it goes from the broadest area down to the narrowest, right? From where you don't really know what you're building all the way to trying to tweak and fine tune the little details in it. And so these are the four major steps that most designers use when they're approaching a project. Discovery, which is making sure that you're building something useful, something that people actually need. Taxonomy is making sure that the broad pieces of it are easy to navigate, that people understand what the major steps are. Mocking and prototyping is making sure the structures underneath that are correct. And then usability testing is for tweaking the final bits of it to make sure that you've got all of the last little I's dotted and the T's crossed. So let's walk through the four steps. First, there's discovery. So this is where you are trying to make sure that you're building the right thing. When done right, it's gonna be collaborative. You're going to not only be working with your developers, with your end users, to figure out what the use cases are on the developer side, but maybe you're actually also talking to their customers to figure out why they're building the API that they're building, what they actually want to get out of the API because of what they're trying to put out into the world. You should be working with product, you should be working with uh, design, you should be working with your data, you should be really making sure to bring everybody into the process at this point to understand as much as you can about the problem you're trying to solve. It's important to really be deliberative here to find what the purpose of your API is, right? And because you're really thinking about the purpose, you have to be thinking about not only the technical execution, but the business strategy behind it. And even if it's an internal API or something where there's, um, where it's more functional, you still should have a business strategy there, right? You're still trying to serve somebody and you're still trying to get to a very specific end case. And so make sure that you have all of the disciplines participating in the discovery process as you're doing this phase. So a couple of techniques that are really common to use here are interviews where you sit down and you talk to people and you ask them lots and lots of questions. And you don't just ask them, what do you want? But you try and figure out what are they trying to do and why are they trying to do it? And you wanna dig in and you wanna let the conversation flow where the interviewee takes it because you don't know what you're gonna learn. And you have to be really open to not just getting your own assumptions validated, but making sure you try and reach out and discover what it is that they want. Another thing that can be really useful that's less doable now is site visits. But sometimes when you're trying to do API research or any sort of discovery, it's really helpful to go on site and see what your customers are doing and how, they're, how they work together. If you understand whether your developers are sitting right next to their product managers or whether the developers are all separate in area, um, things like that with the environment that they're working in can help you understand how much support they need and what they actually are requiring in order to be successful. 
And then another thing that can be really helpful is ethnography. So this is where you're actually going to talk to the customers that your developers are trying to serve to understand what they're trying to do and what their needs are. And you're going to sit with them and just find out more about their lives. And as you do that, you're going to learn a lot more about your developers. You're going to learn a lot more about what you're trying to do. And you're going to be able to then take that and apply that all to your API strategy. And you can also do ethnography with your developers, right? It's not only trying to learn about their the product that they're trying to build, but about what kind of a developer they are, right? Do they, where do they learn um, and problem solve? Are they on Stack Overflow a lot or are they on internal forums? Uh, how do they how do they learn? How do they want to process information? Are they visual learners versus do they like trying things out? And all of these things that you can learn can influence how your API gets designed. So with discovery, I like to talk about three key equations. The first one is that observation is greater than conversation. It can be really easy to just talk to somebody and to listen to them and, and take what they say is very literal. But what you want to actually be careful for is when you're having these conversations, when you're working with developers on discovery, what is it that they do? So maybe they say, you know, you say, hey, would you like this kind of a thing? And they'll say, well, yeah, I guess. And they do that big shrug, right, as they're, as they're saying, yeah, I guess. That, I, you shouldn't then go ahead and say, yes, the developer wants this, right? What you want to say is, you know, the, what's happening there is that that person who you're talking to is actually trying to maybe please you, right? This is a very natural human tendency. And so we want Make sure is use your powers of observation to say, oh, I think they didn't actually like that as much as I thought they would. And so you can take notes of observation over conversation. So making sure you have your video camera on when you're talking to somebody as much as possible is really critical. The other thing with observation is bring other people into the observation with you, right? Don't go and do an interview by yourself, but bring somebody who's got a different perspective to come with you because they're going to hear things and they're going to see things differently than you do. Having that conversation at the end is going to be really helpful. The second thing is make sure that you're including developers and end users, right? I talked about this a lot already, but make sure it's it's a plus, it's an and. Uh, include as many people as possible in the conversation. And finally, a question I get a lot on this one is, how do you know when you've done enough discovery? And for this, I have a little chart, which is to look for the point of marginal return, right? So on the y-axis, you have learnings. On the x-axis, you have number of users. The more people you talk to, eventually you're going to see a point where you learn less and less in each conversation. And once you feel like the, you've had a conversation and you didn't get that much out of it, that you didn't learn that many new things, that's the time when you probably can say, okay, I've done enough discovery. But make sure that you're still getting a diversity of people that you're talking to before you call it quits. Because if you talk to the same kind of person three times in a row, by the third conversation, you probably aren't going to be learning much. But then if you talk to a different kind of user for your fourth conversation, you're going to learn a lot more. And so the curve is going to be a little different for you. The second design technique is taxonomy. So this is the point where if you've done good discovery, maybe one of the things you have now is personas. You have different ideas of who your different customers are and that you're trying to serve. And so that way you can use that to create different journeys for your developers. You can try and build out the API in such a way that you're actually serving the needs for everybody. And especially for documentation, right? We've all seen it where we've got developers, who, some who really like to have a uh, getting started uh, guide and some who really wanna just dive right into the docs and, and go for it. And so you wanna make sure that you're serving all of the personas that you found in your discovery process through the products you're creating. And here with taxonomy, it's really about focusing. So in discovery, you figured out what your API is supposed to do. And in taxonomy, you're now focusing on your methods, your resource names, your or how, how people approach the API and what the order of operations is on, on how they should make their calls. So it's about understanding your developer mental models. And as we all know, naming conventions are really important to developers. They get very particular about making sure that the names of what they're building and the names of what they're using make sense. And so what you wanna do, and one of the things you're trying to find here is that balance between 
the developer's mental model and how they name things versus the industry or the business that they're working with. And you sometimes those things are going to be very well aligned and sometimes they're going to be in conflict with each other. And you want to figure out those things now so that you can make your decisions and be consistent and not have to worry about it moving forward. And so it's really great here. Um, one of the things you're trying to do is get groupings sorted out so you can understand resources and requests. And I'll explain that more as we go through the methods, right? So two of the techniques I really like here, one is called a card sort and the other is called tree testing. So let's dive into an example with taxonomy um, and do a tree testing thing first, which will hopefully help you understand what's going on. So one of the APIs I was building, as I mentioned um, in my intro video, was for an internal tool. And it was about user identities and different information that we connect to a user. So some of the things we had in there, we were collecting lots and lots of different, different pieces of information. But we had things like their birthplace and age and their pets. Um, and we wanted to, we needed some form of object that we could call all of these three objects within it, right? So this is taxonomy, right? All of these things belong to the user, but then what do we call them? And we whiteboarded and we brainstormed a lot of different ideas and characteristics, attributes, tags, details, and none of them really made sense to us. So we actually then we took this and we went to some of our customers, uh, some of our users, and we tried to get them to, to, to take a look at this and let us know what they thought. So did they think that these were details or data? And we got a whole bunch of different answers on it. And what we figured out was that this is actually one where with the taxonomy, we had to just make a call that wasn't intuitive, right? It's a really abstract concept. There's no way to have one word that could actually encompass all of these things in any easy fashion. So I think we ended up going with characteristics, but it really, at the end of the day, this is one where doing this research, we discovered it didn't matter too much. One of my other favorite activities for taxonomy is the card sort. So this is Ben, and he's got a whole bunch of index cards in his hands. And I love using index cards for API user research. They're the fastest prototyping you can do. You can actually mock out an entire, a large complicated API in an hour or two on index cards. And then the wonderful thing is you can change it within seconds by simply taking an index card and writing a new piece of data on it. So what we did is on these index cards, we had the URIs, we had object names, we had the verb, and we were giving, we, I handed this pile of index cards to Ben. And I said, first off, look through all of these endpoints and tell me what does this API do, right? If he could explain to me what this API was doing in a couple, in a couple of sentences, just by looking at the endpoints themselves, that would be really fantastic and help us under, and help us make sure that we were making an API that practically didn't need documentation, right? The second thing I asked him to do was to take each card and look at it. And based on the endpoint that was on there, what would you expect this particular endpoint to do? What are some of the objects you might expect to see within the endpoint? And so hearing him then go through each one in detail helps me understand on, on a specific level, were we getting the names and were we getting the categories of everything right for our API? And then finally, I asked him, you know, can you group these endpoints together into sort of an order of operations, right? How would you work with this API? And what he started doing is what you see here is putting these endpoints, putting these into different piles and grouping them together. And it allowed me to see how he connected pieces together with each other and how he thought about the overall flow of the API. So this is really what taxonomy is all about. It's understanding naming conventions, it's understanding overall flow. And we thought that we had designed something great and correct. And as he started going through this stuff, we learned that there were all sorts of holes and all sorts of assumptions that we had made that were not obvious to him. We had been working on the product long enough that we already sort of had blinders on and couldn't see some of the things that were, were quite obvious. 
So I love doing the index card technique with developers. The third design technique is mocking and prototyping. So this is really now, right, we've gotten what the API does, we have our, end, our major endpoints, and now we're trying to get the structure of each individual endpoint specific and correct. So again, moving from broad to narrow, right, this is about the request and the response body. It's about getting an outline of each endpoint. So we're diving one step de deeper. And one of the things that's really important to note is that at this point, we still haven't coded a single thing, right? We are designing this API and we are getting everything together without having touched a line of code yet. And one of the cool things is for mocking and prototyping, we still don't need to do that, right? Doing all of this work up front though, this is, you know, so discovery can take a, a day or two, taxonomy can take each of these steps you can do in just a handful of days. And it makes sure that once you do start committing to code, you can move so much faster because you have less rework to be done. So with the mocking and prototyping, some of the techniques I really like are paper prototypes and instant messenger APIs. So we'll dive into both of those, right? Mocking and prototyping, this is whether underground's API, and it's just the ability to get the forecast, right? Um, and one of the things you can do with we meant, I mentioned a uh, paper prototype. So you print this out on a sheet of paper, right? This is just, you type up your API and you hand it to a developer with a marker, or in this case, right, if you wanna do it virtually, you put it up on a screen and you ask them to talk through it. Um, or you can even put it in a Google Doc and have them put comments in it, right? There's a million ways to do this remote as well. And what you do is you say, tell me what you think of this API. So when we do this, right, get forecast for London, it's okay, that makes sense, right? I'm trying to, and this is a weather, a weather API, so what is the weather gonna be in London? What you learn is that it's actually, this one is, is a little bit odd, right? Uh, and depending on your audience. So, you know, one of the little things is just like, why do you start with period three instead of having the title first, right? It's much, Wednesday night is probably the first thing I'd need to display to my user, so it's a little thing, but just in terms of readability of your docs, it's, it helps a lot. Another question, what is period? Precipitation is zero. Is that 0% 0 precipitation, inches, centimeters? Right? It's unclear. Um, how does that change if it were snow instead of rain? Um, and so that's another piece that, that's unclear in the, in the docs right now and in the API and should be built in. Um, another thing, if you see there, there's forecast text, and one of them is forecast text and the other is forecast text metric. But shouldn't it be that it's forecast text imperial and forecast text metric, right? Why is this API particularly favoring imperial measurements as opposed to having them all be uh, the other way around? So the more you do this, uh, you can, you'll, you'll get a lot of feedback on, on these details, right? To understand whether you're actually doing something um, correctly. And one of the things that's important with this is uh, make it ugly, right? Don't try and make something that's really perfect that you're presenting to your developers, because if you do, they're not gonna wanna give you very clear feedback. If you make it ugly and let them just write all over it and let them make a mess of it, they're gonna be much more comfortable providing feedback because they're gonna think it's a draft. If they think it's a final product, they're gonna be much more hesitant, so make it ugly. The other technique that I mentioned during uh, for mocking and prototyping is an instant messenger API. And for this one, Slack is great um, or any sort of digital tool uh, that has some kind of chat function to it. And what you wanna do is you wanna take that mock-up of the API that you have and you want to just present your high level docs over to a developer. And it could be even that you're just presenting them with the URIs um, and with sort of a basic, you know, create user kind of description. And then you want to ask them, what do they want? Like, what what is the, what are the things that they would put in a request body? And what you're going to do is a little bit tricky. You need to have a fast typer, and that's why having something ready to copy paste is good. But they're going to put in a request body, and then what you actually do is via the instant messenger, you type back a response body. 
And so this way you can have, you have somebody moderating and they'll say, is that what you expected to see in the response? And they'll say, yes, this is exactly what I wanted or no, I didn't expect to see this and here is why. And so it's another way to get them to express what their assumptions are about your API and to then also get really detailed feedback on what you're building in a way that's uh, approachable and, and can be kind of fun for everybody. Uh, it's just because of the chaos of it. The final step is usability, right? This is where you're mocking up your API. It's full detail. You don't need a back end still. Um, and you want to make sure you're following traditional UX usability testing strategies for this. Um, and this is where you're going to be really digging into the details, like what are the headers you've got? What units? How do you um, display things? What's, you know, and, and really diving into the nitty gritty of it. So for this, um, it's really great to use Postman or Swagger, um, anything where you can actually just sort of have something mocked up and have the, the request and the response come through really easily. So for usability, uh, you want to have a moderation guide and you want to have very clear steps. So if I were building out perhaps a API for a payments company, right, I would ask my developer, here's the API. Can you charge a credit card for $12.50? Um, can you apply a discount of 10% for every person who uses the code API the docs? Right? Can you create a pricing chart for lattes, cappuccinos, and mochas? Um, having a very clear set of steps to do, and then what you do is you grade that you, you grade your API on whether de the developer was able to accomplish those steps correctly or not within your API. Right? If they can't figure out how to apply a discount code and that's something that you're supposed to be providing to them, then that means that you need to go back to how you've done discounts within your API and make sure that you iterate on it. And then you go back and you do another round of usability and you say, okay, how about if, you know, now can you apply a discount code and see if they can figure it out. Um, note that here you're still keeping the docs very light. Right, you're still trying to keep as much as you can of the documentation of the API within the API itself. But if you do this correctly, it makes it so that you barely need to write any additional documentation in order to get somebody to use your API. Obviously, if your API is more abstract or complicated, you might not be able to do it without any docs. And so this can be a great chance also to test your documentation, right? Do the same kind of usability, give them your documentation and see if they can accomplish the tasks that you need them to. So once you've gone through this design, all of this design um, process, you can really feel confident that you've gotten some tests, some really good testing done, and it's a great opportunity to go out and build the API. It's also important to remember though, that just because your API is built, doesn't mean that you leave this behind and you never do design again, right? This design research is an iterative process, and the more you do it over and over and over again, the more you learn. And so make sure that once you've built things out, you can actually come back and do it some more, that you can that you can test again, that you can learn some more about your developers and refine and improve your API. And so this is a great opportunity also then to talk about what happens if you have an API that's already built, right? Because we all love building brand new things, but most of us are actually stuck with quite a bit of a uh, clunker of an API that maybe does, didn't have this done in the first place, so now you're trying to compensate for it. And for APIs that are alive today, you still can iterate and you can still get your way to a more usable API. And the first thing to do is that same design research, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna assess your API through design research. Do the, that process with your current API and understand where your gaps are. You then can create a vision for where you wanna be, right? If you, if you had built it from scratch, what would it look like? And how can you then version your way there, right? So you make this loop that you constantly do. You assess, you create a vision, you version, and you create a strategy where over time, you're eventually going to improve this API and get it to the point where you can actually make it really usable. And sometimes some of the ways you can do this are pretty creative. So let's go through a API that I worked on at one point in time, which was one of these we'll say complicated APIs. So it was a very, it was a get call, right? And you'd think that gets are pretty, are, are pretty straightforward, uh, get reports. And it asked, the, this was what the docs had. It said that you needed to specify your type, so it needed to be periodic, summary, or histogram. 
and then if there was a lot of if, right? If it's periodic, you need to supply this and this, but not this. If it's a summary report that you need, please give us this and this, but don't give us this. If it's a histogram, all we need is these three things. And so the docs were very confusing because you had to do all of these different things and you had to keep track of it. So what we actually did is we put a little bit of a wrapper around our API endpoint, and then we hid a lot of the complication via our documentation. So what we actually did then is we said get reports slash periodic, right? We added, we extended the URI, and then if somebody actually submitted a request to this endpoint, we on our end submitted the type periodic. So we filled that in for the API and hid that. And then what we could do in our documentation is we could just say, okay, give us a start, end for date and time, the interval length and the hours. Um, and so it was a way to simplify the documentation down. And we then did the same thing, right? Get reports slash histogram. We then submitted for them the type histogram and the docs just said exactly what they needed to supply for that kind of report. So it's a nice way to simplify what you're doing via some API wrappers and hide some of that complication without having to completely recode your, your product. So hopefully that gives you guys some some inspiration to treat your users first and how to make sure that you are building out the right thing every time you do it. Uh, if you do have any questions, I'm really excited for our Q&A and for our breakout sessions. And you can always find me on Twitter at Jenny Dell. Thank you guys so, so much and uh, happy user research.